where is your confidence right now that they're going to be able to come to an agreement in the next five, six, seven days? I'm optimistic that this week is the week that they make things happen. If they don't, I think we're in for a long haul. Uh, and that's the, the, the scary uh, part of it. I, I just feel like this is a critical week. I understand the February 28th deadline. I think it's dead on. You got to be ready to go through spring training. Um, and if we, we, we miss that and we blow through the stop sign this week, uh, like I said earlier, we're going to be in big trouble. That's Harold Reynolds of MLB Network not mincing words, explaining how big of a week, how big of a moment this is for the lockout and for baseball. And he is our guest Today on the White Sox Talk podcast brought to you by Wintrust. Hey, everyone. It's Chuck Garfine. And as the co-host of Hot Stove, along with Matt Viscursion every weekday morning on MLB Network, Harold is really plugged in on both sides of this. And he has a lot of thoughts about what's going on with the lockout and what the two sides need to do to come to an agreement this week. Monday, the players and owners had by far their longest negotiating session of the lockout. Uh, the owners made a tweak to their proposal. The players are expected to make one when they meet on Tuesday. So this was definitely a step in the right direction. But how do they end the lockout? And also, why does Harold have such high expectations for the White Sox? You don't want to hear what he says about Luis Robert, Tim Anderson, and Tony La Russa. So, it's Harold Reynolds on the White Sox Talk podcast. It's coming your way. All right, Harold Reynolds is with us. Uh, hey, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks, and it's uh, great to see you. It's been a long time, uh, going back to the time we worked at ESPN together like 50 years ago. That was a long time ago, no doubt about it. Good to see you, man. You're looking good. Not as good as you. Not as uh, good as you. And actually, you were looking great last week. I know you'd never played for the White Sox, but I'm watching Hot Stove. Oh, yeah. And you're wearing a White Sox Field of Dreams jersey on the air. Yeah. And about, yeah. So what, what led you to want to wear that on the air? Well, it's one of the best uniforms I've ever seen. I mean, flat out. Uh, outside of the game, the Field of Dreams game was amazing, but the uniform. Uh, with the cool socks on it, uh, it was it's pretty special. So I just decided I was going to wear that that day. I was starting to wear a different look for different games, different teams, but I thought that was uh, pretty special. I actually got a call from Jerry Reinsdorf on that one. He was like, I love that jersey. I'm like, thank you, Jerry. So, yeah, it's, it's a special one. And you seem to be a believer in the White Sox because you go back to the end of the regular season, and I noticed this, and I'm guessing yeah. a lot of White Sox fans did too, you picked the White Sox to win the World Series, beating the Braves, correct? Yeah, I did. I felt like uh, they kind of fizzled at the end, but I felt all things were there. But the, but I think early on, I, I really jumped on their bandwagon before a lot of their injuries. And I still feel like we get through this lockout, we get back on the field, and at some point we will play baseball. Uh, I still think that team is intact, and – primed for another great run. I, I like where the White Sox are at, and I, and I still think they got a chance to uh, win a title with this group of players. What do you think they need to take the next step? What do they need to do either on the field with who they have already or to sign or acquire to help them get to the next step? Well, obviously the pitching depth is, is the key and it's critical. Um, you had a few guys maybe step back instead of continuing to move forward. So I think if you're able to get uh, that one veteran pitcher that kind of takes the heat off of young guys that are learning. You know, one thing I've learned through the years and even my own personal experience is as a young player, you grow, you take steps, but there's always that one step back. And it's nice to have that veteran guy go, hey, I've been there. You're going to be OK. And I think that's where we're at with the White Sox. They need uh, that one veteran pitcher, uh, right hander that has some some velocity, but also has that experience to be able to say, hey, I've been there. It's okay. You're going to be all right. So I, I, maybe that's Lance Lynn. Maybe he takes that that rain and that next step now. Uh, but I think they're, they're at that point. All right. I want to talk about where we're at right now with the game. The players and owners meeting Monday and scheduled for Tuesday all through Friday to try to get a deal done. So there'd be regular season baseball on time 
And for that to happen, they have to have a deal done by, it looks like, February 28th. So where is your confidence right now that they're going to be able to come to an agreement in the next five, six, seven days? I really don't believe that the sides are that hard to get together. You know, we're not talking about pension plan. We're not talking about free agency never existing before. We're not talking about a lot of the hard hurdles that happen of the wars of battles through the years. You know, we've had basically over 20 some years of labor peace until 2020 when COVID hit, we had a little snafu. And then now I just don't believe in my heart of hearts, the issues can't be settled. Um, so I think there's a shot. The, the biggest thing that's been going on right now is it's been a drip, drip, drip. They haven't met on a daily basis. So they both mapped out and agreed they're going to meet this whole week. So you may get heated, upset, walk away one day and think it's never going to happen. But you know you got to go back to the table the next morning. And that's how things get done. So hopefully uh, I'm optimistic that this week is the week that they make things happen. If they don't, I think we're in for a long haul. Uh, and that's the, the, the scary uh, part of it. I, I just feel like this is a critical week. I understand the February 28th deadline. I think it's dead on. You got to be ready to go through spring training. Um, and if we, we, we miss that and we blow through the stop sign this week, uh, like I said earlier, we're going to be in big trouble. Instead of it being, you know, you and me, me and you, um, it's like a they. Like, there's no we in this. And I wish mm. the players and owners would feel more of a we. And it's so antagonistic. How did this happen? Is it really going back to back when you played? I mean, you were part of the 94-95 strike. Yeah, I, actually, in my 12 years of major league career, I went through uh, four labor disputes. You know, so... Um, I hope it doesn't harken back to those days because um, those issues that I laid out earlier were real. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where this is coming from right now. I think we have different ownership than we did years previous. A lot of the owners in the, in the past, that was their family fortune. You know, there was a different fight they were fighting for. Um, I, I, I hope that the players don't underestimate owners because this is not – the same owners that, like I said, these guys now, they own multiple businesses that bring in billions of dollars. And if they want to sit in a, a stare down, I think the players lose in a stare down. And the biggest loser of all will be the fans. So I, I hope they can work this out, figure it out, and get something going. But there's too many smart people involved that uh, hopefully the egos are off to the side and we can get something worked out. I mean, you're you're close to people on both sides. Yeah. And you kind of touched on it. But what are you hearing? What are you hearing from the owner's side? What are you hearing from the player's side in terms of what both are asking and where things are at? Well, it's kind of funny you bring this up because on my way to work today, there was an accident on the side of the road. Four car accident on the on the lane across from me. But if you'd asked the driver that was driving in front of me, they probably saw something different than what I saw. And both sides are saying something and they're seeing it, but they're all seeing it differently. And that's what happens when you get into a, a situation where we're at right now. Um, so I, I hope they can see the greater picture. And is that, a, that is a being ambassadors for the sport. Hmm. I, I think our sport is in, uh, a bigger challenge than we've ever been before with all the other sports flourishing like they are football, basketball. We watched the NBA on Sunday, put on their show the Sunday before the NFL did their thing in Super Bowl and just having kids and being around youth sports. Uh, there's a lot of kids that a lot of other things to do. You know, there's soccer, there's lacrosse, there's, there's tennis, there's sports that I would have never thought about playing when I was a kid that are now available to the masses. And so I think those are things that uh, we have to understand and recognize in, in our sport that if we don't address this properly, we are going to lose fans through this whole thing. I don't get too much into the nitty gritty about what they're fighting for. I mean, we've talked about it a lot, but Harold, I want to get you in the room. I want to put you in as a mediator. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So if you were to get into the room with the players and the owners this week, what would you say to them about to get a deal done? Not just 
the temperament in the room, but like, hey, owners, you need to give the players this. Players need to give the owners this. Well, it's funny. Um, having been uh, in the union for so many years, I, I see the players saying, look, here's what we want. We want to take better care of the zero to three player. They want to get paid better. Mm -hmm. uh, we're concerned about teams feeling like they're not giving forth the, the right effort to win games. There are too many teams losing 100 games a year to try to get a draft pick positioning. Um, and then those have been the two major issues. And then, obviously, free agency, and we want it to be make sure that continues. I get all those issues. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, I see the owner saying, I hear you. I hear you. And their proposals have addressed those issues. And the frustration for me has been, all right, they heard the complaint. They put a proposal on the table. And the player's like, eh, we're not talking to you right now. That's the frustrating thing. And I'm looking at it more like a parent. You know, it's funny. I used this analogy the other day on TV, and I guess I'll use it to our viewers. But what, during this COVID time, you, you haven't had a lot of kids coming into your household. And just recently, we've been able to start letting the, the kids have friends come over. And so my middle daughter, she was the fastest one to bring kids over. And she's flooding the house with kids every day. Well, my younger son is like, well, Ella gets to bring people over. And we're like, yeah, you get to now, too. Yeah, but Ella did it for two weeks in a row. Yeah, but you do, too. Yeah, but Ella. And I was like, that's over. And I feel like that's where the players are at. It's like, they, but they locked us out. They didn't talk to us for five weeks. So why should we listen to the proposal? Get over it. The proposal is on the table. Negotiate. That's what I think how I see it. And so if I was a mediator, I would tell them, let's 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 negotiate this deal. It's not that difficult if you start talking. Uh, the negotiation hasn't begun yet because there hasn't been any negotiating. It's just proposal. OK, we'll get back to you in five days. Proposal. OK, oh, proposal. I don't like it. And we'll get back to you in five days. And, and it's, it's become so personal. That's what is really frustrating for me. Right. Yeah. And I, you too. I, I think the other part of it is, OK, what do you really want? Hmm. Where are we at? And until you know what you're buying a house and what the price is, you're not going to continue to negotiate on that house until you know what the price is. And so I, I, I think that's where we're at in these negotiations. There has to be clarity as to here's what we want. Here's what we're looking for. And let's talk. And that really settles the whole thing. So Manfred said, what was it, three weeks ago, that if they lose regular season games, it's disastrous. How big of a disaster is it going to be if they lose it? Because there is the part of me that says, this is me trying to be optimistic, even if they lose a month, at least there'll be a baseball season. People will get over it. But do you feel like there will be real damage if they do lose, say, a month of the regular season? Oh, uh, No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's from a financial standpoint, meaning, you know, it's going to hurt the wallets and that type of stuff. The concern, I think, what Manfred was pointing at is the fans. Remember, this guy's negotiated four of the last contracts. He's been in baseball for over 20-some years, 30-some years. So he's seen in, in 1994, 95, if we don't have a Cal Ripken or we don't have a home run chase, I don't know where the fans are today mm -hmm. with our sport. So I think his his view is similar to what I talked about earlier. There's a lot of other things that are in play now where the family's going to spend that dollar, and more importantly, their kids are going to participate in those sports. When I hear Rob Manfred speak, I'm trying to imagine what it's like to be in his shoes. And what I mean by that is it feels like just as you watch him, oh, he's just speaking for you know himself representing the owners. But – You've got a lot of different owners who have different teams, different market size, different approaches and opinions about this lockout. And there's a kind of a dance that he has to make to try to uh, appeal to all of the owners. Is that part of what's going on here and why maybe we're not at a consensus of how this deal could actually be finalized? Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? 
Yeah, I do. I, I, I think, though, I think he's he's got a united front in the owners and understanding what they want to do. I, to them, what I hear is, what do you want? You know, they're, they're still trying to figure out where the players are at and what they're asking for. Uh, it's almost like a moving target, and they're not going to negotiate against themselves. The other part of this, too, though, that is very clear is how long can you hold the United front? Because you do have some owners that are sitting there going, I don't do business like this. If you don't want to be part of this participation, then we'll just wait them out. And that's legitimate. Um, and then obviously they all have the concern of fans because they understand fans are what makes this thing go round. But um, he's in a difficult spot. There's no doubt he's got some people pulling at him one way or another. But for the most part, I do think they have a united front and a united message of understanding we got to get this done, but we just need to know what is the negotiation points where we can really try to sit down and negotiate and bargain. All right, so say they get a deal done this week and the players have a month of spring training. Is that enough time, especially if you're a pitcher? It's enough time. Uh, once the calendar hits as a baseball player, uh, you get past – mid-December, 1st of January, you're working out on your own anyway. Uh, pitchers are throwing bullpens. They're getting good work in. So from that standpoint, you're not starting from zero when camp starts. Uh, you probably have four or five days of practice, and then you start playing games. And if you can play four weeks of baseball games, um, you should be able to carry into the season. You said, yeah, some guys get off to a slow start. Mm -hmm. but they're comfortable and healthy enough to play. So four weeks is a pretty good gauge. Uh, I always wanted to have leave camp with, with 60 at bats. If I get 60 ABs, I've been able to work on some things, have at bats where I could take pitches and hit with two strikes, see what I could do. Um, those type of things, but you have a different agenda for different players mm -hmm. with a veteran guy who's trying to make a team. I got to come out gangbusters right now or a young guy trying to make a club, an established veteran. Uh, it's just opening day is my target date. I want to be ready that last week of games to make sure my swing or my pitches or whatever on command. So there is a different agenda depending on where you're at in your career. So for everybody, I think four weeks is fair. But I think four weeks of games, not just spring training, is really what makes mm -hmm. it work. And that's that's the difference. I know Manfred says four weeks. Players are saying four. I think four weeks of games is different than four weeks of training. So if that's what you're, if what you're saying is true, then they're going to need more than four weeks of spring training. Do you think they might, if they say they have a deal in a week, they would maybe have a five-week spring training and it might jeopardize the regular season, but it might be better for the health of the players. Would they maybe go that route, do you think? Or there's going to be 162 or bust and we're doing four weeks of spring training period? No. Once we get past uh, losing games, we're not making them up. Mm -hmm. We learned that experiment with double headers and changing rules to make things work. Uh, we had, what, the Cardinals – take 24 different cars to drive to Chicago to play one weekend. And I know that was COVID related more so than what we're discussing right now, but there's still COVID impact that's going to happen. We're still seeing athletes that have to sit on the sideline mm -hmm. because of COVID. So let's set the COVID part aside and stick to just regular baseball. Baseball alone in 2021, we had over 800 players end up on the IL over 800 players. There's only 1,200 players in the union. So we're looking at 800 of them that were on the IL list with COVID and with regular injuries. We had over 30 some guys with hamstring injuries. Yeah, so Sox I, had a bunch of them. Yeah, so you know you're gonna have your injuries, and uh, I should say 99 players ended up with a hamstring injury on the IL. 99 players. And the average time on that IL for that player was 28 days. So that's a lot. And that's just a hamstring. I'm not talking about a sore arm. I'm not talking about a oblique injury. None of that. So um, it's important to have a full, healthy spring. A couple more questions. And it's about just the White Sox 
and two guys in particular, Luis Robert. In Chicago, we're thinking this guy could win an MVP. Do you look at Luis Robert like that? And if not, what do you see from Robert? Crazy talent. Uh, could he be an MVP? It wouldn't shock me if he won the most valuable player. I would not. Because you, you hear this a lot about players today. He can do it all. This guy really can. You know, he can run, he can hit, he can hit with power. Uh, he's young. But I think with the coaching staff and with Tony La Russa, nobody molds talent better than Tony. I think mean, if you look back at players he's had, whether it's Pujols or Ricky Henderson or all the way back through the years of Tony La Russa, um, Kittle, to you name it, he's always been able to mold guys into here's who you are. Don't try to be that guy. This is who you are. And I think I've come across a lot of people in baseball. I think Tony's the best at being able to say, how do you feel, Tony? Let you know in four hours. You know, we <laughs> always say, take it one day at a time. I think Tony's a one day at a time guy that he can sit there and keep that perspective. And as a player, that helps because it's easy to go 0 for 10 and be caught up in the three days prior. Mm -hmm. And Tony will go, take care of today. Just worry about today. And if you go back and you look at young players playing on the tone of the Russa, he gives them that mindset of worrying about today. Take care of what you can do. So I think Louis Roberts got the right guy for him right now. And then Tim Anderson, fellow infielder, you played second base. How he's evolved, matured, and blossomed as a major leaguer. What is, what's your take on T.A., where he was and where he's at today? He's uh... – He's just learning. He's just figuring it out. I think he, if you want to say MVP out of Tim Anderson, I wouldn't be shocked. Mm -hmm. He's got that kind of talent. Um, the defense has really settled in. And again, I go back to La Russa. It's inning by inning, out by out, game by game. He makes you focus. And as a young player, as a young infielder, it's easy to drift off. And you can't miss a pitch. You have to be locked in for the whole game, every pitch, because that ball might be hit to you. And that's the toughest thing to learn. And I had a manager in Dick Williams who made that real clear to me. If you can't concentrate every pitch, every game, I'll find somebody else. And sometimes you have to have that. And I, I, I watched that growth in Tim Anderson with La Russa. And Tony also will tell you, you're one of the most talented guys I've ever seen in my life. You're one of the most talented guys I've ever seen in my life. What I'm seeing now from La Russa, is he starting to say things publicly that he would tell players behind closed doors? Like, hey, you're the most talented guy I've ever seen in my life. He would tell the guys that all the time, but you never heard it publicly. You, it came off like, man, he's really on this guy all the time. Now you're hearing him say, Tim Anderson's one of the most talented players I've ever seen. You didn't hear that from Tony 15 years ago. You do now. Why do you think he's changed? I think he's been around long enough. I think... What makes Tony adaptable is you have to learn the generations that you're coaching. You know, when I came in, coaches didn't talk to you. They yelled at you. They told you what to do. <laughs> that wouldn't fly today. Well, Tony managed and played in those times. And now he's been able to sit there in this generation of, I got to pat you on your back constantly. Mm -hmm. And he's able to do that. So I think his ability to adapt in the times is why Tony La is still around. How do you think he did as his manager first year back first time in a dugout in a long time i thought he was he was what i expected mm -hmm. you know he took a team that had a lot of talent but had not gone to that next level and was able to do that i think they'll even be even better this year uh and giving him another year the one thing i'd like to see the white Sox do is have the next who's going to succeed tony he's not going to manage forever He's already in the late 70s, and I would like to see that successor on his roster, on his on his coaching staff, so he can learn all the things that Tony's doing right now. I think that's how you keep that continuity going. Well, Harold, I appreciate all the time you've uh, given me, and I really hope that we have a deal done in a week. We need baseball. I, 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 I'd like to think the owners and the players realize that, too, that the damage that can be done, but... We're not in the room, you know? We're not in the room where it happens. But uh, maybe we need Hamilton in there. But we'll see. We'll get it done. I think Chris Bassett said, send in the women. 
<laughs> yeah. they'll, get, they'll get the deal. They done. would get it done. <laughs> they would get it done, no doubt. All right. Hey, Reynolds, my uh, great appreciation for you coming on the podcast. The White Sox Talk podcast brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to the special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk podcast is over.